Hi. Thank you all for coming. I am, there we go. I am Amanda. I'm a brand designer here at Strava. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, what it's like being a brand designer and particularly an in-house designer. You okay? Oh, sorry. Okay, bless you. <laughs> so jumping in, I have identified and boiled down what I think are the two things that make up a really winning brand design. The first one is what I call a household name. It's when people can quickly recognize your brand in the wild. So that's like you see a logo, you see an ad or a billboard and you immediately know the company. Even better is you like hear the name on the BART and you, you know it without seeing anything. So that's like that quick recognition. The second component of the winning brand design, I think, is what I call the chocolate factory. I'm going to caveat this and just say these are not industry terms. So the chocolate factory is that positive association with your brand. Um, even better, it is anticipation and engaging with your brand. Um, it's kind of those like quirky moments. I think of it like the Willy Wonka chocolate factory, where there's that sur delightful surprise around every corner and you can't wait to get there. Um, and so the thing about these two qualities that make up a winning brand design is that they are kind of naturally at odds with one another. The household name re requires a kind of consistent familiarity that makes you comfortable with that brand. Um, it makes it feel credible um, and reliable. But the chocolate factory quality is what keeps it exciting and keeps it churning. It's like you turn a corner and you're licking wallpaper and then you run around and you're jumping into a chocolate fountain and it keeps you coming back. So I'm just going to rewind a little bit and give you a little bit of insight. I didn't know what to call this slide, so I figured Amanda was like an apt title. So I'm going to give you a little background about me. Um, I've had a pretty uh, varied uh, design background. So I started out actually as an analog printmaker, making posters, woodcuts, lithographies, and etchings. Um, and from there, I was an architectural brand designer. And what that meant was before a building was built, I would um, design the branding for it. And so in the five years that it took to, for a structure to go up, you could kind of like get some marketing out there, some anticipation, some hype about that place, whether it was like a residential place or maybe like a new building on a school campus. So there were a lot of different clients. It was like a, a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different types of, of buildings, little, little brand projects. Um, from there, I actually went on to co-found a, a product design company, not a digital product, but a physical product. Uh, the company was E1 Timepieces, and we made timepieces for people who are visually impaired. And as a co-founder, I led marketing, uh, brand identity, and the visual design. Um, and then went on to a traditional design agency called Stoltz up in Boston. Um, I did everything from the Bright Horizons signage outside of a daycare to like the dental convention is coming to town and someone's got to design that brochure. So again, a lot of different stakeholders. Um, and then I was a book designer actually just around the corner at Chronicle Books. Um, and there I did lifestyle books, uh, self-help books, I did a lot of cat calendars, that was really big when I was there. Um, but again, a lot of, it felt like a lot of different clients. There's like a different, for every manuscript, for every author, it needed a new look and feel. Um, after that, I, was, I went into design consulting at an agency called IDEO. They're located, headquartered in the Bay Area. And the work there was incredibly conceptual, really future-facing. Um, I mostly dabbled in full environmental build-outs, so hypothetical build-outs in retail, in automotive, and in medicine. So really exciting, fertile work, but again, a lot of clients. Um, and that kind of brings us to the present day. So how did I arrive at being an in-house brand designer? When I looked back on my full career, I like kind of did this little Blink. And I noticed that a lot of my work was in consulting. And so what that meant was a huge breadth of work, but I didn't really get to go super deep because a client would essentially, as a consultant, they would come up to me, tell me a little bit about their company, maybe push some brand guidelines toward me. And then it was my job as a consultant before Strava to 
like come up with some designs, make some suggestions, like present it, and everyone's like, whoa, that's so shiny and new, I love it. And I'd be like, peace. And then the in-house designers would have to like pick up all the pieces and then quickly scramble to try to figure out how to make sense of it. Um, so I felt like it was like really love them and leave them. And I was like having a blast. But I really wanted to see how my design could be implemented, get out into the world, what the feedback was on that, and then how it could evolve into something else or how it would change over time. And so, bam, Strava. Um, I came to Strava uh, in-house. For me, this was a huge move. It was a little like settling down. So Strava made me some promises. <laughs> And then I was like, I'll honor and respect your brand. You can trust me. <laughs> so far, it's been really good. Um, so as soon as I was hired, I kind of jumped into it. And I, this is like a little delay, but I jumped into it with like the kind of same intensity and fervor that I had done the decade before in consulting. And what that meant was like, I was like, we're going to look, it's going to look like this. It's going to look super cool. We're going to use motion this way. This is a little vignette of like my first few months at Strava. A, like a lot of really fun and engaging visuals. I felt like there was something for everyone, a little nugget that people could grab onto. Um, and I think that the work was really fun. But when we took a step back, we noticed we were really squarely over indexing in that chocolate fatter, factory excitement. Um, and we were missing a lot of the balance that pushes a good brand to become a great or extraordinary brand. One where, yeah, you're getting all of the like, those like shots of endorphins when you see something new and you want to engage it, but there's that reliability and that consistency and that familiarity. And so um, the last, like, I've been here a year plus now, and I would say that we've been working really, really hard to bring that visual consistency, that strength of brand, that awareness to all of the visuals that we have done. This is just the last few months without losing that nugget of something really interesting and good and juicy. And for me, that means like in-house has a really apt name. I kind of stepped back and I was like, why do they call them in-house designers? And I was like, oh, I get it now. After, I, after this presentation, I get it. So I think that it's called in-house because when you join a company, a house, a home, um, you are tasked with being a part of that place as the brand designer. Um, it's not your job to tear down walls or relocate bathrooms or decide that you want a sunroom or like a, like a outdoor sauna. Um, but it is your job to keep things interesting there, to make a house, which is a company, into a home, uh, to paint the walls or bring in pictures. And at the end of the day, like you want it to be someplace that is welcoming, that is reliable, but you also have the liberty to bring home the occasional Oompa Loompa. Thank you.